Last week we saw as Paul uh, was in Jerusalem, we saw two weeks ago, he was in Jerusalem. Uh, he, he was told to go there. He was also told by the Holy Spirit as well as other prophets what was going to happen when he got to Jerusalem. And of course, as stated, he was arrested. A mob tried to kill him. Uh, then a, there was a conspiracy to actually murder him. Uh, but the Romans protected him, and because he is a Roman citizen and said as such, uh, he had a right to go to Caesar. So he went off to Caesar. And last week we saw as God used him uh, to not only preach to the Jews, but also then to basically every step along the way, uh, to governors and to kings, to explain why he was doing and what he was telling people and preaching the gospel to each of them along the way. And it was a two-year-plus journey. Is that a long trip? Yeah. He was in bound, not completely. He was given some freedom. He, people could come and visit and things like that. But he was still under arrest for over two years as they tried to figure out what to do with him. And the biggest problem was what? They couldn't find a charge against him. For over two years, <laughs> they basically just kept trying. We can't send him to Caesar and say, we want him tried there if you have no reason to send him to Caesar. You don't waste Caesar's time that way. And they could find absolutely no laws, nothing to be even discussed or question under Roman law. And as we saw and as we see in the Word of God, that should be the same with us today. The only reason the government should ever come after us and should ever charge us with anything is if they're lying or what? It's because we're preaching the gospel. That's it. So those are the only true reasons. And Rome didn't care if he was preaching the Gospels. They had nothing against him at all, but they kept having to try to move him to another person, move him to another person, finally got to King Agrippa, and finally they said, well, he wants to go to Rome, we will send him to Rome. But what we saw also was, again, we're talking about the acts of the church. What was everybody else doing? Well, they were still supporting him. This entire time, again, two years under arrest, and there were still brothers and sisters who were coming and encouraging him. And there were some who were with him the entire time because they were supporting him and what he was doing, getting that gospel out. In fact, let's look at Acts chapter 27. That's where we'll start tonight. And you'll note we're getting dangerously close to the end of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 27, verses 1 through 4. And when it was determined that What's that word? We. We. I want you to look at that word. There's two words I want you to note tonight. The words we and us. When you see those words, that means, first of all, Luke, but also others were with Paul throughout this adventure, or some would call misadventure, as he heads to Rome. And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one Julius, a centurion of Augustus's band. And entering into a ship of that place, Adramitium, we launched and meaning to sail by the coast of Asia, one Aristarchus of Macedonia, a Macedonian of Thessalonica. Again, we've seen him before. He's gotten into trouble before. He's been, he's been persecuted before, but he's still what? Hanging in there, still supporting, being with us. And the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. Now, do you think that was a common thing back then? We mentioned this last week, that a centurion would say, hey, you're a prisoner going to Caesar to be considered... Possibly for death. But you know what? Why don't you go take off for a little while? Why don't you go hang out with your friends for a little while? He trusted him. He'd been listening. He'd seen how he'd been treated. And plus, they really still had nothing against him, did they? 
Maybe they were hoping that they would. Maybe, yeah, do something wrong, or frankly, at this point, I think he could get his paperwork just lost somewhere if he just happened to leave. But, <laughs> but he let him go, and what did he do? He went to his friends. He went to the church. The church continued all along the way to encourage him. There were with those with him on the boat, and then there were those that each place he landed, there were people ready to come and refresh him and encourage him. Do we need to do that when people are going through tough times? I mean, Paul here is being used in amazing ways to reach the highest levels of the government with the message of the gospel. But still, how many think it was probably hard on him physically, mentally, spiritually? And he needed people to come and refresh him. Even the centurion could see that. And when we had launched from thence, we sailed into Cyprus because the winds were contrary. So again, what word do you see there that we're going to look for all night? We. So at least Luke and probably Aristarchus, plus or maybe there were others that came with him now. So let's start up tonight's lesson and start in verse 5. And you'll see a couple of exclamation points. There's going to be a shipwreck and there's going to be a snake bite. So these are good times for all, right? So let's see what happens starting in verse 5. And when we had sailed over the sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put, what's the word? Us. Therein. So again, Luke and Polaris Darkest, at the very least, are still hanging in there with him. Verse 7. And when we had sailed slowly many days, and scarce were come over against Canidus, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete over against Salmone. So here, they're, they're part of this trip, right? The church is going with them. Luke and them are going with them on this trip to Italy. Verse 8. And hardly passing it, came unto a place which is called the Fair Havens, nigh whereunto was the city of Lycia. Now, when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already passed, so you get the time of year there, Paul admonished them and said to them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading and ship, but also of our lives. So, Paul's been given an understanding here, right? Now, is Paul a sailor by trade? No, he's a tent maker by trade. So what great evidence does he have of this? Lord's letting him know, right? This is not, this is not going to end well. You're going to lose the ship, you're going to lose the cargo, and you're going to lose lives. Now, let me ask you something. How many think Paul also told that to Luke and Aristarchus? If this ship sets sail, it's going to be bad. Now, you're Luke. You're a doctor. <laughs> man of science. Man of knowledge. Man of understanding. Also a man who knows that God doesn't get things wrong. Are you going on that boat? You don't have to go on that boat. <laughs> You're not bound. You're not, you're not, the centurion doesn't tell you what to do. You can get off that boat. If you're Aristarchus, you can just do what? I think I'll sail to Thessalonica. <laughs> I think I'll go back home. I think I'll head this way. You don't have to get back on that boat, do you? Let's see what happens. Verse 11. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. Now, don't get on the centurion. That just makes sense, right? And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to part thence also, if by any means they might attain to Phoenice, and there to winter, which is an haven of Crete, and lieth toward the southwest and northwest. And when the south wind blew softly, it looks like a good day, supposing they have attained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. So, there were a couple of reasons. One, they said it's good to go. Plus, where they were at was not good for winter. This is what they typically did. They would find some place, 
when the winter times were coming, you could tell the weather was changing. You usually found some place, stayed there for the winter, and then when spring came, the wind started blowing, you could get that back out on the sea. You didn't go in winter time. What's Paul know though? It's coming early. It's coming early. <laughs> it's coming now. This is not going to be a safe trip. And of course, they took the advice of the owner and the master of the boat. Plus, they looked out and said, well, it looks pretty nice now. <laughs> Winds are soft, looks good. We can at least make it to a better place and have safety. So they thought. Verse 14. But not long after there arose against it, the ship, a tempestuous wind called Euroclidon. Ever had one of those? It sounds intense. Yeah. Basically, I mean, I looked it up, and it is basically a type of storm, like we would call a derecho or <laughs> those kinds of things. It was a, a like a, like a, almost like a European cyclone. <laughs> like, it's like it came down and struck them. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, what was that next word? We. We. And I was hoping in verse 13 when it said they went. No, meaning it meant the master and the sailor and all those guys. They decided to go that way. But we see clearly who got on that boat. Well, Paul, he had to. <laughs> he had no option. Centurion's going, he's going, right? But Lucas, Luke and Aristarchus, at least, probably. There could have been more. And it says, we let her drive. Let her loose. Let the wind take them where it goes. And running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by that boat, which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship, and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, strake sail, and so were driven. And everybody understood all of that, because you guys are master sailors. You know exactly what all those things mean. Basically, they did everything they could to try to get that ship to go where it's supposed to, and they could not. So they're letting her drive. Verse 18. And we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lighted the ship. So again, that's that word we, right? And so clearly they can't do anything. If they keep all that weight as it's being tossed about, they're going to go flip over and they're going to sink. So what do you do? You start lightening the load. So what do you lose first? Basically, the things that are worthwhile. <laughs> the things you were shipping, the things you were doing. You're tossing all that weight overboard. Seems like somebody said something about loss of stuff. Oh, yeah, it was Paul. You're going to lose stuff. You're going to lose your purpose for going here, right? They started to lay this ship, verse 19. And the third day, we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. Now they're getting rid of the ropes and all that stuff. So even if it gets good, yeah, it's going to be tough. And by the way, who's doing this? I just could picture Luke out there. This is fun. If only somebody would have told us. <laughs> this is called dedication, right? Verse 20. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. Awful. This is awful. This is my nightmare. <laughs> I don't like being in water. I don't like rocking back and forth. I, I just, this sounds horrible. And day after day of nothing but wind and rain and just darkness, darkness and just... Now it's been three days. How many are ready to say, why am I on this boat? Mm -hmm. They were only there to support who? Support Paul. This is something I have to remember. No, I'm not asking you to get on a boat or anything like that. But sometimes we know that if we support somebody who's going through a tough time, it may cause us to have to bear some difficult things too, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to have to sacrifice. And again, I want you to think, Luke and Aristarchus knew that by getting on the boat, bad things were going to happen. Because Paul told them bad things were going to happen. 
And even there was going to be a risk of life by getting on the boat. And they said, what? If the Lord wants me to support Paul in this way, I will do it. That's called real support, isn't it? And they're just getting started. Verse 21. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, I told you so. <laughs> you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer. Now, I like how it says, but after long abstinence. You get the idea that Paul's been fighting his tongue for several days now. <laughs> It's like, I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to say, I'm just going to help throw the stuff overboard. I'm just going to mind my own business. But on the fourth day, he's got to say something because he has a message. And yes, it starts with, I told you so. But also, he has a message of good cheer, doesn't he? Well, and also, you know, I told you so is, is, I mean, yes, it was probably satisfying. But he does need to remind them, last time you didn't listen to me. That's right, right, that's true. <laughs> listen to me. I've got good cheer this time. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but the ship's going. <laughs> You're going to lose the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul. That thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with you. This is good news, right? Encouragement from who? From God. Howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island, and when the fourteenth night was come. Now don't pass over that too fast. <laughs> On the fourth day, he gets a message, right? Everything's going to be good. No loss of life. You've got to go to Caesar and everybody else, Luke, Aristarchus, whoever else is from the church, but also everybody else in the boat. Everybody's sailing, sailors, the centurions, the other prisoners. Everybody's going to be alive. But then, how many days later is it now? Ten more days later. I don't know about you, but 14 days in the middle of a storm in a ship that's just no direction at all, just <laughs> being tossed to and fro, sounds awful. But, be of good cheer. <laughs> and let's face it, sometimes what we have to go through seems like it's never ending. It's just one day after another of storms and waves and beating rain and darkness. But what does God say? Be out of good, good cheer. I will get you through this. And that was the message. And again, as Lucy said, was God right about what was going to happen in this? <laughs> no. If he was right about that, then yes. Because let's face it, if I'm one of the sailors and he tells me that, I'm like, great, we're getting to that island tomorrow, right? <laughs> but after another 10 days, are you starting to think, well, maybe this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. But it seems like they trusted him. Yeah, what can you do? Verse 20, and when the 14th night was come, verse 27, as we were driven up and down in Adria, about midnight the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country and sounded and found it 20 fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it 15 fathoms. Is that good or bad, by the way? Yeah. <laughs> It means the land's coming up to meet you, so to speak. <laughs> and if you're in a ship, that's you're going to stop. <laughs> we also may be crushed on rocks and stuff like that. Verse 29. Then, fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. <laughs> like, throw the anchors and let's hope we make it through the night. That's best all they could do. But what had God said? be of good cheer. You are going to make it. You just have to get to this island. Verse 30. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea, under color, as though they had been casting anchors out of the four ships. So, so the sailors are like, hey, we need to get off this ship. There seems to be land over there. But we don't want to take everybody. So we'll pretend we're throwing out anchors, and we'll throw out boats. 
gems of men, right? <laughs> Salt of the earth, these guys, right? We're going to save ourselves here. But who knew they did that? Verse 31, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except these sailors abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. You leave the ship, you die. No guarantees then, right? Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. Now, <laughs> who's listening now? Soldiers are listening. I was just the big picture that the entire time Paul's been talking to these soldiers, right? Anyways, so, <laughs> so they have some idea of who God is at this point. And clearly, Paul was right at the beginning. They've been safe so far. So he says, nobody's getting off this boat. No sailors are leaving here, and they cut the boats free. So now they have no lifeboats. And they're in a big ship near rocks, near some island. They don't know where they're at. Being tossed around for the 14th day. What happens next? Isn't this exciting? Yeah. Ooh, what happens next? Verse, uh, verse 33. And while the day was coming on, so you see the sun is rising, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This day is the 14th day that we have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. How come they have meat in 14 days? Because it would be a waste of time. <laughs> If it goes down in this kind of weather, I don't care who you are and how stable you are of mind and body, it's coming back out. <laughs> so, no point you fast and just, again, you're just riding it out. You're just taking water, that's about all you're doing. But he says what? You need your strength now. Because this is coming to an end. Verse 34, Wherefore I pray you to take some meat, for this is your for your health. For there shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, hmm. he began to eat. Yeah. What picture is he giving them there? Yeah. Communion and salvation and the one true, giving them the one true God, right? Then were all of good cheer, and they also took some meat. And were, we, we were in all in the ship 200, three score, and 16 souls. How many is that, by the way? What's three score? 60 and 16. So 76. 276. You get an idea of a small boat? How many would say that's not a small boat? That's not a small boat. I don't care if there were prisoners like stacked next to you like cordwood. You know, that's still a lot of souls, right? And what has God said? Not a single one will die. So be of good cheer. And they listened. Had the storm stopped? No. But now they were what? They're really listening to Paul. If he says it's going to be okay, if it's okay to take meat, then we need to get strength. All 276 are like, let's eat. And they all took meat, and they all got nourishment, which they will need. Verse 38. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and cast out the wheat into the sea. So they still had a little bit left. Threw everything in, and when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore, into the which they were minded, if it were possible, to thrust in the ship. So I see so a little creek going into an island, so I said, maybe we can park it there. So, maybe. We'll see. Verse 40. And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves into the sea and loosed the rudder bands and hoisted up the mainsail to the wind and made toward shore. So they had the mainsail left. They let go of the rudder that had basically been uh, hold tight. And that's what they would do. They didn't actually rubber bands or put a band on the wheel so it didn't turn. So because you're just being tossed by the sea anyway. So they said, okay, we're going to make a run for it. We're going to make a run for that spot. Verse 41, and falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the forepart struck fast and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. So they lost half the ship. <laughs> but the front end's okay. And the soldier's counsel was to kill the prisoners. Yeah. Whose order was that? Standing order. You run aground. Kill the prisoners. They don't get away, right? Plus, you don't have to take care of them, you know. 
find food for them and stuff like that. You don't have to give them the prisoners, right? Protocol. Lest any of them should swim out and escape, but the centurion, remember that guy? Willing to save who? Paul. Kept them from their purpose and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land, and the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. Let's hear it. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. If you can swim, jump, folks. <laughs> get to our land and get in there, right? And we see here what? We see, first of all, God was right, of course. Mm -hmm. But also we <laughs> see God using Paul, even in this situation, even in this difficult situation, to bring good cheer, to bring good news, to bring salvation to people if they will just what? Listen, right? But for the purposes of our study, since we're studying the church, who went on this wonderful little adventure, this three-hour tour? <laughs> <laughs> the church did, right? Willingly, probably a paid <laughs> to go on this trip. That's what you'd have to do unless you're a prisoner, right? Right, paid to go on this trip because they wanted to support Paul. Knowing, and they knew ahead of time that this something bad was going to happen, yet they went anyways. And through it all, they kept saying, we threw over the tackle, we helped out, we took me, we, <laughs> and they supported him and helped out all along the way. And this is a message for us today, isn't it? Some people are going to go through some tough times. Some people are called by God to kind of be out there and go through some difficult times. It's important also that God calls others to what? Support them. To be with them. And will it always be easy? Are you always just expected to kind of be from the sideline yelling, go, go? Or sometimes you guys be in the middle of the fight saying, go, go, go. <laughs> in this case, they were definitely in the middle of it, wouldn't you say? So, they get to land. They still have no idea where they are, though. All they know is they're, they've been tossed around for 14 days. Where could you be? Yeah. Anywhere. Could be in South Carolina. That's all they know. <laughs> <laughs> they got to find out. Verse 28. Chapter 28. I'm sorry. Chapter 28. And when they were escaped from the ship, then they knew that the island was Melita. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness. It's weird that they call them barbarous people. But they were. But they were also what? Very kind. <laughs> and very helpful. For they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. See, it didn't rain on that island too. It wasn't just out in the sea, right? This storm had enveloped the whole area. Keep that in mind, right? These people have also been dealing with a storm that had been hitting their island, and they see these people come aboard, come along. They're Romans. 276 people come towards you, Roman soldiers, sailors, and prisoners all coming towards you, and their first thought is what? Let's make a fire for these poor people. Let's give them some food. Let's help them out. Can God even use other people? To meet our needs as we go along the way? Yeah, he can. And he does in this case. Verse 3. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. What we learn from this? No good deed. No, that's not what we learn from this. So, which is funny because Paul's you know, doing some rough work here. <laughs> it's out gathering some wood, doing nice things. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said amongst themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer whom, though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. Very reasonable. <laughs> right? Escaped the sea, but he gets bitten by a snake. But what did he do? Panic? What did God tell Paul on the ship. Caesar. You're going to see Caesar. That wasn't just getting off the ship. He hasn't been, he hasn't been to Rome yet. He hasn't seen Caesar yet. So you got to think the thing going through Paul's mind is, hmm, that's not going to do it either, is it? So he just what? Shook it off. Chapter 5. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit, 
the barbarian, they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Now, it doesn't say that he corrected them, but how many think he probably did? So, <laughs> he's had that problem before. So, But yeah, is God going to protect them the entire way? No matter what happens. But not only that, I mean, we have a good God, don't we? Yeah. We've got a great God. <laughs> not only does he protect them from the shipwreck and also from the venomous snake, but God goes above and beyond. Look at verse 7. In the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. So not only do they get a little fire, which is nice, but then the chief of the island says, hey, why don't you stay with me for three days? And who gets to go? Well, at least, at the very least, it was Paul and Luke and Aristarchus, and maybe others too, may have been some of the soldiers and things like that, but they went and stayed. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux. I hate that. <laughs> To whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, others also, which had diseases in the island, came and were healed, who also honored us with many honors. And when we departed, they laded us with such things as were necessary. It's like, okay, yeah. So we're going to give you fire and a snake, but we're going to give you fire. So you can warm yourself and dry off a little bit. But not only that, we're going to put you in a nice place. And then we're going to actually have the people bless you. <clears throat> bring all your necessities and bring them and give them to you for the rest of your journey. Is God good? Very good. <clears throat> Verse 11. And after three months, we departed in a ship of Alexandria, which had wintered in the isle, whose name was Castor and Pollux. Sounds like a good pub. Castor and Pollux. That's right. So basically they ended up wintering there, right? And God provided for everything they needed. And landing in Syracuse, we tarried there three days. And from thence we fetched a compass and came to Rigium. And after one day, the south wind blew, and we came the next day to Petulio, Petioli, Petioli, where we found brethren and were desired to tarry with them seven days, and so we went towards Rome. So now he lands in a place, and there's what? There's Christians there. <laughs> I got to spend seven days with them. By this point, the shipwreck and everything is what? It's old news. We got through that. We got through the storm. We got through all that. Now God is just heaping on them blessing after blessing after blessing. And again, Paul comes in with Luke, with Aristarchus, and the brethren, what? Greet them and bring them in and say, let us spend time with us and encourage them even more as they head to Rome. Verse 15. And from thence, when the brethren heard of us, they came to meet us as far as Appii, Forum, and the three taverns, whom when Paul saw, he thanked God and took courage. When he saw, again, word went out. Everybody come see him. Everybody come and encourage him. He's going to Rome. Everybody come. And they came and spent time with him. Verse 16. And when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was suffered to dwell by himself, with a soldier that kept him. So even in bonds, God says what? Give you a little special treatment. And again, a lot of it has to do with what? They still have no charges against him, right? They still have nothing to say or hold him. Because he's done things the right way. But what we see is all along the way, we see God's hand, don't we? They should have not sailed. But they did. But even in that, God gave Paul... Companions to go through it with him gave him a message of hope that he then could give to all the people gave them an island to land on where people were hospitable to him 
to help him and then used him to heal people, which brought more provision and more assistance to him. And then every step of the way from there, he kept running into brethren who would encourage him and help him and get him to Rome. And next week, we will go to Rome. What happens in Rome? I love what happens in Rome. But through all this, what do we see? And again, we focus on Paul, but let's focus a little bit on the church here. You may not be the one that's the focus of what's going on. That's Paul in this case, isn't it? He's the focus. He's the prisoner. He's the one going to Rome. He's the one giving the gospel. But does that mean everyone else just sits around and does nothing? No. Some are called to be there with him in the midst of the storm, literally. In the midst of all of it to encourage him and help him. Some are there to just come when he comes by and come and encourage him and be with him and fellowship with him when they have the opportunity. Some are to help him and provide for him. And other ones are, of course, praying still, aren't they? I'm sure back in Jerusalem and back in Antioch and all these places, the church continues to pray for him. Keeping in mind, it's been over two years now since people in Jerusalem, people in Antioch and others had seen him. People in Ephesus had seen him. Yet, I'm sure they were still, what, praying for him as he heads to Rome. Okay? And now he knows for sure, as God told him, you will make it. <laughs> you will get there because I've got work for you to do. Does God have work for us to do? And we have to be willing to do whatever it is, whether it's the focus or whether it's come alongside or whether it's encouraged or provide for or pray for. We all have it. And you see the church as a whole getting him through this as God works through him. Any questions or thoughts? I have a thought. Yes. Paul, in other places, talks about how he supported himself and didn't allow people to do things to him. But in this case, he was able to accept. Mm -hmm. I think that's also something to consider. Is yeah. He accepted the help. Yeah. People wanted to come along. Because he could have turned to Luke and Aaron Stuck and said, this is going to be, be horrible. <laughs> God told me this trip's going to be terrible. Don't come, don't get on this boat. But then they probably would have said the same thing that he said to Agabus, which is what? Well, God told us to go, so we're going. We're going through it, right, with you. So I would have had second thoughts and third and fourth and fifth thoughts. And I would have had at least 14 days worth of thoughts. But <laughs> so whether I should really be on that boat or not. Uh, but they got through it too, didn't they? And God provided for them as well and got them so that Luke can write such a vivid story with all the details of everything that happened on that poor little boat. Not a little boat. Pretty big size boat. So, all right. Any other thoughts?